Carry on. Good morning, War College. <laughs> there must be a backlog at the gate. But uh, I'm smiling today for many reasons. One is it's Friday, and I'm going to fly home tonight, although I'm flying US Air through LaGuardia. Laughter. Uh, so I'm hoping I make it, but I haven't seen my two boys for two months down in Norfolk and uh, haven't seen my wife since the change of command, so big family reunion tonight. So I'm happy about that. Uh, I just spoke for an hour over at the command leadership school to 50 naval officers getting ready to go to command at the commander and the captain level. And, uh, and so I'm all pumped up over that, you know, 7.15 to 8.15, and they're all excited to go to command. And one of the things I did while I was there, which I've never done before, was the remarks that I'm about to read to you, I read to them because I thought they were so appropriate. Uh, but the third reason I'm smiling is because Admiral Jamie Kelly is sitting down there. Stand up, Admiral Kelly. Turn around and face. Just stand there and listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Admiral Jamie Kelly has just been hired as the de Dean of the College of Operational and Strategic Leadership. So he's going to be responsible for the how, you know, the War College is about thinking leadership. You know, leadership that thinks, thinking and leadership, move them around however you want, but there's leadership right there. And I've known Admiral Kelly uh, throughout my career. I've been watching him from afar. Uh, he's inspired, he's an aviator, but he used to inspire my destroyer captains as they, as they went across the Pacific and he was setting them up liberty in Australia or fixing their reduction gears in Singapore. Uh, he's an amazing guy. He commanded strike group. He commanded US Forces Japan. We're lucky to have him. He's going to get up and leave here in a couple minutes to go try to find a house. Even though he's an admiral, he still has to find a house. Um, General Schoomaker, thank you for being here, sir. We're honored to have a three-star Army doctor here. I always tease, tease, you know, general, doctor, which is cooler. They're both cool to me. Uh, but we're lucky to have you here. And the final reason I'm smiling is because of this topic, uh, ethics. Uh, one of the last things my boss in Norfolk told me before I came up here, he said, hey, John, I really want you to focus, you know, on that leadership stuff, that Stockdale stuff. You know, we were really blessed to have Medal of Honor winning aviator Stockdale be the president of this university, and he changed this place a lot, this college. Um, a lot, he changed it a lot for the better. So I'm a happy guy. Uh, I'm in a good mood. Ethics is a great topic. You guys are, well, I'll get to the script so I can get off the stage. I'm a little early, so I think I got time. All right, so thanks you all for being here. General, thank you for being here. Now I'm going to hit the prepared remarks and turn it over to Martin to get things underway. On every occasion I've had as president of the Naval War College, I've stressed with you the remarkable fact that your nation has made a decision that it was valuable and important to give you an extended period of time for intellectual growth and development. I can't think of another profession that allows its best members in the middle of their careers almost a year of time to pause in the practice of their profession, to stand back, read, think, write, and converse with fellow professionals. I've stressed the theme that it is vitally important that you appreciate this remarkable opportunity and use it to your best advantage in your development as a leader in the profession of arms. But this morning, let's reflect on what assumptions underline the decisions that got you here. Most importantly, while the military profession is populated with doers, it assumes the doing must be deeply informed by a body of professional knowledge and judgment that guides the doing. Why? First, because our nations have placed an enormous amount of power in our hands and needs to be sure as they can that we will use it responsibly. They only do it if and to the extent that they trust us. Trust us to serve our civilian leaders apolitically and unquestioningly. Trust us not to shame or embarrass our nation by our conduct. And they believe that giving us these chances to grow intellectually help ensure that trust is not misplaced. In other words, our intellectual growth and development is grounded in a belief that it shores up our professional ethic. The topic of professional ethics is intended to be a thread that runs throughout the curriculum here at the Naval War College. There are ethical aspects of almost every topic we discuss here, and it is a hope and expectation that those aspects be discussed as appropriate throughout the year. Our nation has entrusted us 
one of the most vital aspects of any nation's life, the defense of its sovereignty, political integrity, and interests. It expects us to be thinking hard every day about how best to ensure that we are as prepared as possible to carry out that mission. Further, it expects us to be adapting as necessary to changing circumstances to ensure our relevance to any future conflict. And that adaptation requires, first and foremost, serious hard thinking that will eventually translate into determining future force structure, acquisition programs, the employment of operational art, and strategies for maintaining material and training readiness in lean budget years. You have done that kind of thinking in all aspects of the War College curriculum this year. Still, it is desirable to focus specifically on ethical questions in focused events as well. This conference is the last opportunity in this academic year. As you look at the program, you can see that what we will be discussing is that we will be discussing, discussing a wide range of topics. Indeed, at first glance, it may not be obvious to you that they are topics in ethics at all. Often when we think about ethics, we think somewhat narrowly in terms of personal behavior issues such as truth-telling, uniform code of military justice violations, and joint ethics regulations issues such as receiving gifts. And of course, all these things are important and failures in those areas are serious. But as you rise in rank, ethical issues, like everything else, become more complex. It is no longer simply a question of your personal behavior. You are members and increasingly leaders of a profession, a profession of arms. As such, you are entrusted by your nation with a profound responsibility for national defense. You are expected to be loyal and obedient, even when you may personally disagree with policies and leaders above you. You are bound by an oath to the Constitution of the United States, or whatever equivalent may be for the international officers here. You are responsible for the evaluation, promotion, discipline, and retention of your fellow professionals. All of these aspects of your professional life generate a unique set of ethical obligations that emerge from your status as a professional and set you apart from your fellow citizens. Today we will have the opportunity to reflect in three areas. Lieutenant General Schoomaker, the Surgeon General of the Army, will discuss a range of issues concerning our obligations to our sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines in the broad areas of caring for their minds and bodies. In the U.S., every serving member has chosen to serve, and if asked, to put themselves in harm's way. Harm has indeed found many of them, injuring them in body and mind. We, the broader society, but also their military services, have obligations to them for those injuries. General Schoomaker will help us think through the nature of those obligations to you here. And for you as commanders, for your subordinates, as you leave this place of reflection and return to the fight. The status and role of retired officers in the profession is a worthy one of reflection. Are retired officers still members of the profession? On the one hand, they are still governed by the UCMJ and retain their commissions. On the other hand, clearly they no longer command or bear responsibility for operational matters. But what if, as was the case for General Keene, they come to believe existing policy is leading toward catastrophic failure. Is it appropriate for them to use their often quite considerable influence to alter the course of events, even over the heads of those who currently bear those responsibilities? General Keene will give us a very frank discussion of precisely those issues, based on his own post-retirement involvement in helping persuade President Bush to persuade the surge strategy in Iraq. Lastly, and as you all know, very shortly it will be the policy of the U.S. that gay and lesbian people may serve openly in our armed forces, a position some officers enlisted have opposed. You will be the leaders charged to implement that change effectively. Lieutenant Colonel Latandre, Lutandra, excuse me, who was on the Air Force team charged to assess that policy change, will help us think through the nature of our professional obligations as sworn servants of the Constitution in implementing policies and the tension some of you may feel between your personal, political, moral, or religious convictions and your constitutional role. Our goal in this conference is the same as the overall goal of a war college education, 
to prepare you to be the best and most effective leaders of the profession you can be. And now to introduce the themes of the conference, I invite Dr. Martin L. Cook, our Stockdale Professor of Professional Military Ethics, to further frame the issues of the conference. Martin. Well, I think given the excellent introduction the Admiral just gave us, I won't, don't feel any need to further frame the issues, so let's get at it. Um, our first speaker this morning is Lieutenant General Eric V. Schoomaker. He was sworn in as the 42nd Army Surgeon General in December 2007, assuming command of the U.S. Army Medical Command. Before his, this selection, General, uh, Lieutenant General Schoomaker served as the Commanding General Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, by the way, he was brought in after the Walter Reed scandals to try to solve those problems, so he's intimately familiar with that set of challenges. And the North Atlantic Regional Medical Command. General Schoomaker graduated from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, was commissioned a second lieutenant as a distinguished military graduate, and was awarded a Bachelor of Science degree. He received his medical degree from the University of Michigan Medical School in 1975 and completed his PhD in human genetics in 1979. General Schoomaker completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, followed by a fellowship in hematology at Duke University Medical Center. He is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in both internal medicine and hematology. His military education includes completion of the combat casualty care course, medical management of chemical casualty care course, AMED officer advanced course, Command and General Staff College, and U.S. Army War College, where I had the privilege to work with him some uh, when he was a student there. General Schoomaker has held a wide variety of assignments in the U.S. and overseas. It's truly a great privilege to welcome uh, him to the Naval War College, his first visit, he tells me. Uh, he will be discussing professional military ethics in the context of responsibilities to veterans and wounded warriors. Welcome, General Schoomaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having Well, good morning, and uh, let me just tell you what a great privilege and it is to be here to, this morning. Uh, Admiral Christensen, I'm, I'm so pleased that I was on time today so I could hear your, your opening remarks because I, I, I can't think of a better uh, introduction to, to what I have to say today. And quite frankly, I don't think any of us in uniform and in leadership um, ever um, um, are poorly served by not listening to, to comments such as yours this morning. So I, I appreciate that. That was, that was very sobering. Um, this is my 41st year as a commissioned officer in the United States Army, having graduated as a, as a, as a cadet uh, from the ROTC in the mid-60s. And this will be my last year in, in uniform. So it's truly a, a, a distinct pre a privilege to be here at uh, at uh, the pinnacle of uh, education for, for, for the Navy. And, uh, and I can't thank you enough, uh, Admiral and Martin, for, for the invitation to be here. So students and faculty, fellow military leaders, uh, to include uh, your new dean, uh, congratulations and welcome. Thank you for this privilege of speaking here today uh, during one of the capstone events in your professional education and training at the college. As a graduate of my own senior service college, the Army War College, I'm mindful that I'm addressing the most accomplished mid-career officers from your respective services, your agencies, and for our international students from your nations. So an invitation to be a part of this unique year of military education is a real honor that I respect and I will cherish. It's particularly humbling to share the podium with some truly remarkable military leaders and thought and opinion makers uh, on the subjects that you're studying for on professionalism and ethics in this series. General Keene was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army during the year that I was an Army War College student. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of and, and sensitive to what he's done to lead soldiers and the entire Army and to continue to shape national and international attitudes toward our military and the use of the military instrument of national power, both uh, for the U.S. and for our allies. He and others who have spoken or will speak to you um, are remarkable leaders and scholars in, in the critical topics that you're going to be discussing. 
Although I struggled while I was a student to contribute in some scholarly way uh, to uh, the, the curriculum of the Army War College, I did serve on the Chief Staff of the Army's, uh, then General, now Secretary Shinseki's uh, Army Student Working Group that looked at, in, in depth at the well-being of the Army. In fact, I'll remember that year vividly for having been promised a, a year of rest and relaxation and having purchased a $560 uh, family um, golf you know, um, membership at the golf club and then going into a project that had me working in every spare minute and I think I got one golf game that cost me $560 that year. <laughs> but it is true, as the Admiral uh, alluded to, that this is a rare and privileged year for, for uh, those of us who, who enjoy this, this privilege and benefit. And, it, and I was often reminded by people like Martin uh, Cook that this will may be the last time that I actually get a full night's sleep and get to think about what I'm doing and I laughed at the time but 10 years 11 years later I can tell you that 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 was uh, closer to the mark than than I like to believe uh, because from here on out for all of you as senior leaders you will find the, the decisions and the issues that you're facing coming at you fast and furious. And so the time that you spend in this kind of deliberation and reflection, I think, is, is extraordinarily valuable. I did, however, uh, serve a very important purpose at the uh, Army War College. I was one of only two physicians in the, in the Army that was at the War College that year. And so I spent the day on a golf cart during that one day of competition, athletic competition, with the National War, uh, War College and the National Defense University. Uh, you know, resuscitating uh, you aging uh, uh, athletes who, <laughs> who for one day think that you're 18 years old again and by the end of the year I think 65% of the class had, had broken itself uh, in, in various ways. And, and so I did, I did feel like I contributed in some small way to the scholarship of the Army War College. I want to thank uh, Dr. Martin Cook personally for the invitation to join you and for his vision and leadership in supporting discussions of, of these difficult ethical issues throughout his tenure here at Newport and the other service universities and academies that, that he has uh, served in. My goal in speaking to you today will fall into three uh, broad categories. I think I got this right. Yep. First, I, I want to briefly discuss the issues surrounding our collective responsibilities to care for wounded, ill, and injured warriors, that is, servicemen and women from all of the uniformed services and civilians who deploy at our sides from the, pers from the perspective of, of military medical professionals. I'm acutely aware that the vast majority of you in the audience really haven't taken a separate oath to care for warriors and families as medical professionals, but I, but I feel I can move into a broader discussion of institutional and shared responsibilities for the warfighter if I first describe the ethical imperatives for medics uh, writ large, that is physicians and nurses and combat medics and corpsmen and the myriad of medical species that comprise the ranks of military medicine. Like many of you here, I, I come from a military family with a growing tradition of service to the nation in uniform. My father, uh, whom we lost last summer, a veteran of three wars, World War II, uh, Korean War, and, and the Vietnam War. My older brother, uh, a nephew and a niece, as well as that niece's uh, husband, all have served and or are serving right now in uniform. I even have a, an Air Force pilot nephew who's a fellow alum of the University of Michigan, probably the smartest in the bunch, a physics graduate. And when I asked him, what the hell's going on here, you've got a grandfather, uh, an uncle who's the chief of staff of the Army, another one who's the, the, the Surgeon General of the Army, and an 82nd Airborne uh, cousins. He said, I watched how you guys lived and realized there's a far better way of life <laughs> in uniform than what you put up with. And I have to say, as he flies planes between Germany and Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan, I think he's probably right. I'm mindful that many of the professional ethic, mo ethical motives, and by the way, I should mention, uh, one of the things that the Admiral told me this morning, and uh, it's, it's very clear to those of us who know his brother, Joe, that uh, one of the best features of, the, of your Admiral is that he's uh, the brother of a very distinguished um, Army psychiatrist, uh, a physician now retired um, uh, as a colonel and uh, well-liked and well-admired throughout the Army, Joe. 
I'm mindful that many of the professional ethic motives for the actions of non-medical professionals, line officers and non-commissioned officers, are closely aligned with those of the medical and nursing professions. This insight has really been among the most rewarding features of my own time in uniform. Um, I believe that I can describe what compels medical professionals in their duties and responsibilities and then uh, in doing so can enter into the larger topics more easily. I, one of the more um, interesting and, and, and memorable uh, days I spent with my older brother who uh, some of you may know was the chief of staff of the army at one point actually was my boss, something I don't recommend for anybody in the audience by the way. <laughs> Uh, I remember when he was announced after I became a flag officer, he was retired at the time when I was selected for flag, and, and my aide came in very excited that they, that, that, that they announced he had been called out of retirement to be the chief staff of the Army. Isn't this great? Your brother is going to be the chief. And I said, why do you think that's great? <laughs> he, I said, do you have brothers? <laughs> do they like you? <laughs> so uh, that experience of... Uh, working closely and intimately with a, a, a fellow flag officer and, and very distinguished and accomplished soldier, uh, as well as with my experience with my father and others, uh, taught me through the years of this close uh, allegiance between the ethics that guide uh, the professional soldier and, and frankly the physician, nurse, and others. Uh, I, I, I started to say that I spent a, a, a very memorable a uh, few hours in a panel discussion, just he and I uh, talking at the medical school at Bethesda, the Uniformed Services University of the, Me of the Health Sciences about the parallels and differences between the relationship between a commander and his or her soldiers, and I'm a soldier, so you'll hear me talk frequently of soldiers, but, but by extension, any, any service member, and a physician-patient relationship. And I was struck as this unrehearsed dialogue took place with, uh, with the, the facilitator and the audience, how very close the parallels uh, are between those of us who administer to the suffering of, of uh, the ill injured and, and wounded and, and you as professional military officers. Um, uh, quite frankly, we, we share in common along with the, the jurist and the, and the cleric uh, this fiduciary responsibility to, to place the health and well-being uh, and, and the, the needs of others to include the nation above our own material well-being and safety. And, and, and that, I think, is a very close and tight bond be between our two communities that has never put me, I think, in, in jeopardy or, or in conflict. My second goal is going to be to open up a dialogue about our institutional or organizational responsibilities to, the, to care for wounded, ill, and injured warriors. Those responsibilities underlie our programs for warrior care within the Army, which we provide in Army hospitals and other service hospitals uh, around the nation and the world, in our civilian network partnership hospitals and in the clinics and in treatment facilities and practitioners of the Department of, the Veter of Veterans Affairs, uh, the VA, which is, as you know, I hope is a separate uh, cabinet level uh, uh, of uh, federal uh, health care entity. These organizational imperatives are the driving force behind our programs for transition of soldiers and other warriors back into uniform or into meaningful and successful civilian lives and or into ongoing care within the VA and in other sites of care that we may be giving it. Much of the debate, much of the media attention, much of the congressional interest and concern of our senior DOD leadership as a whole has been with this aspect of our work in military medicine. With regard to those uh, uh, for whom we care and my own authorities and responsibilities, I, and, and I've alluded to this, I'd like to restrict my comments to soldiers. I am a soldier. I serve as the Army Surgeon General and Commanding General for all garrison-based care in the Army, as well as the uh, conduct of biomedical research and, and medical supply chain management. So I really feel most comfortable restricting my thoughts to my own service uh, where most of my experience lies, and so I'll be referring to soldiers or warriors aiming uh, principally at those in the Army. It's not an effort to marginalize or in any way be dismissive of the care of sailors and Marines and airmen and Coast Guardsmen and others, but I'm try just trying to stay in my lane as the Army's top doc. Finally, Dr. Cook asked me if I wouldn't address issues of a medical nature, especially regarding behavioral health challenges which our soldiers and, and other warriors face, including many of you in this audience. 
and, and what leaders like you need to be aware of in charting your own way ahead. Every dialogue about the care of others and the attention to the well-being of those entrusted to us as leaders is actually an encounter with our own concerns about our own health and fitness in a holistic sense. And so I welcome the chance to both speak to you this morning as well as field any questions that you may have or observations about the health of military leaders such as yourself. One other legacy of my Army War College days is that I, as a certificate I have on my wall very proudly in my office as the class spring butt. Um, parenthetically, I campaigned to be the class spring butt. I'd had to, I had to be told by my classmates that that's not something you typically campaign for. Uh, but, but I actually come from a community that values asking questions and replacing out, outdated and unhelpful notions about what we know or think we know and believe with new and different ideas. And so I really see the title of Spring Bud as an honorific one, and, and I'm very proud of having won the campaign to be the class Spring Bud. So I'm really most interested in questions and discussions which I trust will follow these thoughts today. And, Dr. Cook has, has told me, has assured me that you're not shy about engaging in dialogue, so I'm looking forward to the questions that you might have. Let me turn first to clinical ethics of the military medical professional. The practice of medicine in uniform is virtually identical to the practice in civilian life. In general, we observe four complementary or competing ethical principles. First, the, the principle of autonomy, that is that patients have choices and should control their own health destinies, even in uniform. The principle of, of non-maleficence, uh, many of you know this as, as above all uh, else do no harm, uh, primum no, no seri. The third is the principle of beneficence, it's the opposite of, of maleficence, that is that we seek to do the best for our patients. And finally, the, the principle of justice, that we will treat all patients the same and that we won't deny our services and care for uh, some over others. Now, one or more of these principles are at play at dif in difficult decisions that we all face. Uh, there, there often aren't right answers as to how they should be decided, a reality that makes seminars on ethics very difficult for younger doctors and, and, and nurses who want black and white, cut and dried answers to really tough questions. Uh, what we are most often faced with are decisions, sometimes under the most extreme pressures of time and circumstance, rivaling those that you must make in combat in which competing principles come into play. And that's really where ethics is. It's important that we understand that the underlying tensions, that what are these underlying tensions are, and that we're comfortable with our decisions and our actions. In my view, because I think fundamentally we are moral beings who strive, when all is said and done, to have acted in concert with our own moral code and professional ethics. We all want to know that we're acting for a greater good and a higher moral construct than simply for our own survival or our own selfish needs. I'm often reminded that when we fail to do that, we pay a deep personal, psychological, and spiritual price. Let me share with you the vignette, or at least the uh, issues that we faced early in the war when treatment teams, uh, forward surgical teams, or the equivalent in the Marine Corps and Navy, um, had to make some very tough decisions about uh, who got blood uh, uh, that was available for resuscitating uh, casualties uh, when there was a mixture of, of, uh, of uh, enemy combatants and uh, there was the anticipation of coalition or even U.S. Uh, uh, friendly casualties coming down the pike. And when decisions, and, and our ethic is that we will treat all patients uh, irrespective of, of uniform. Uh, they, they become humans in need. And when decisions were made by some of the teams to, to sequester blood and not uh, administer it to a, 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 an enemy uh, a casualty uh, in need, um, later on uh, suffered psychological and, and uh, emotional and, and, in a sense, ethical uh, uh, consequences of that. Um, that I've been privileged to work throughout my career with others who share this the same commitment to ethical behavior is among the most compelling reasons that I have, have remained in uniform uh, long after I could have left the Army and, and Army medicine uh, to practice elsewhere. Uh, let, let me just tell you another story that I, I frequently think about. 
that, that in cap, in, in, in encapsulates for me, uh, captures this notion of, of the drive to, to, to uh, practice ethically. And it, it may seem uh, tr somewhat trivial to you uh, for the kind of decisions that many of you have had to make or, or, or will make. But when I was, uh, first came into the Army and was training younger physicians at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, uh, late one night, while I was off the wards, one of my young residents uh, admitted uh, an elderly man who was an extremist who was very possibly going to die that night. He, he was diabetic. Um, he, he was blind because of his diabetes. Uh, he had lost a lot of functions to include kidney function and others. He was in a near comatose state in, in, in bed. And as she went through the exam and the labs and looked through the old charts that were available to her, she came across uh, the, an order that had been issued in a, in a remote hospitalization, one, one removed from this one, that authorized the do not resuscitate order, that if the patient were to have a cataclysmic or life-threatening event, the, the staff, the nurses and physicians, were, were not to feel compelled to resuscitate the patient and would allow nature to take its course. Well, it, it's both legally and ethically uh, not right to simply transfer that order over, at least at that time it wasn't. And she was compelled ethically and legally to go and engage the patient. But this is a patient who, for all intents and purposes, appeared moribund and, and incommunicant. But she felt really um, under the burden of, of trying to resolve this conflict. And so at, at some uh, risk of embarrassment to her, she, she went into this room late at night shared by several other patients, I, I might add, pulled the curtain, pulled her chair up very close to the side of the bed, and in his ear, as, as loudly as she could, because he was, he was, she thought he was going to be very hard to arouse, she said, Mr. Smith, you know, I'm Dr. Worth. Um, I'm your physician, and I'm working here to, to do everything we can for you. I, I noted in your chart at some time in the past. And at this point, the other patients are waking up and, and kind of poking out of their own little um, you know, bed space and, and are perplexed by you know, what's going on here and why she would even attempt something like this. This fellow hasn't really been aroused or made much of any motion or said anything since he was admitted hours before. And she goes on to say, you know, I'm, I'm just concerned that I have a clear understanding of what your intent is with respect to life-saving procedures if something ha happens tonight. Are you still of a mind not to be resuscitated if a life-threatening you know, event occurs? And the man says, Dr. Worth, I'm so glad that you asked me that question. And of course, she almost falls off her chair. He said, I really thought long and hard about this. I'm a very strong Christian. And I talked to my minister about this because I was afraid that by agreeing to not be resuscitated, I was essentially committing suicide. But he helped me understand that allowing nature to take its course was not tantamount to suicide. And so I'm still comfortable with an order of do not resuscitate. And she left the bedside and went and wrote the order. Now, what struck me at the time, and every time I tell that story, and I still get chills when I do, is, is not that she got it right in a three, theoretical sense. Frankly, I, I wouldn't have known uh, what she was faced with. I wouldn't have known if she uh, had fudged on this whole thing. She, she would never have had to share with anybody whether or not she had had this kind of a, a conversation with a patient. But I've always been grateful that this young physician took her responsibility uh, to act ethically and truthfully, that she went to the trouble and did ensure that she was acting with a patient's best interest in mind. I, I, the trust I gained in her judgment and actions thereafter were raised immeasurably. And that's the character of the people that we work with, that they are compelled to act ethically even when no one's watching. Military service can complement or less frequently than one might anticipate interfere with these abiding ethical considerations for the medic. One of the most familiar pop popular treatments of this issue was, uh, was on the old uh, television sitcom MASH. Uh, everyone got to, every, I hope everybody is old enough to remember MASH. Anybody? Okay. Uh, 
Everyone got to see the annex of this Korean War based uh, mobile army surgical hospital. There are no mashes left in the army. The last mash has been converted to a combat sport hospital, but th this was actually based on an, a mash. It was the 4077th for, for the series, and its doctors and nurses and medics and leaders and others were depicted against this tableau of ethical challenges in the army, uh, in an army that was fighting as a joint and coalition force in war. You may remember uh, Captain uh, Hawkeye Pierce up there, uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, Pierce. Uh, where is he? Right here. He, he promoted the primacy of beneficence, doing right to people, and struggled with issues of, of medical justice in a foreign war with, with limited resources. And he often exhibited, in my view, disregard for patients' autonomy, including the personal choice of soldiers to serve as soldiers in a desperate fight. Um, he often chose instead to take them off the line with what he called the million dollar injury or the million dollar wound. He was always the one who said, you're lucky, you got the million dollar wound, you're going home. I often wondered how many less experienced replacement troops ended up dying because Hawkeye sent a, a battle-hardened troop home with a trivial injury and his replacement was killed or maimed in the first 30 days of combat because they were inexperienced on that same battlefield. Hawkeye disrespected the right of the soldier to decide to act as a free moral agent and to conduct and to fight. Major Frank Burns, you remember Frank Burns? Where is Frank? And they left him off the picture. Uh, earlier, later generation of pictures of the, of the cast. He demonstrated different attributes and, and ethical challenge. He prided himself in being operationally savvy and fully militarized, but he was an incompetent surgeon. He failed to understand that our first imperative is to be professionally qualified to practice medicine or nursing or, or to conduct surgery or to lead in a professional and effective fashion. If, if, without that, how do we avoid doing harm? We continue to, to this day to face decisions which involve ethical considerations similar to the ones that were faced by the characters in MASH and the real military medical heroes from past wars that they depicted. As one example, we may be faced with a decision to remove a limb of a, uh, that's been severely injured in an IED attack or other combat wound at least three months or as late as a year or, or, or more um, after the injury. We call this a delayed amputation. At least 134 of our wounded warriors at Walter Reed and other medical centers have chosen to have delayed amputations for injured limbs, mostly legs, and have had them replaced with prosthetic you know, devices. In fact, for every amputation in this war, seven other limbs are severely wounded uh, or injured to the point of almost uh, uh, a disability of that limb. And at some point in the next five years, about one in five of them will elect to have that limb removed. Pain management becomes less of a problem. And with these, the new high-tech te prostheses, a significant amount of function is restored for, for no normal daily activities. The decision for delayed amputation is not taken lightly by physicians and the rehabilitation team as a whole. A limb once removed is gone forever. Patients are asked to spend a significant amount of time considering their decision. Behavioral health consul consultation is required and discussions with outsider consulting physicians, other amputees to learn about their experiences and, and physical therapists and other members of the team. That, those discussions really need to take place, but the decision is left to the patient. This respect for autonomy is an important component of clinical ethics. Personal autonomy to make smart choices about one's health care requires an adequate understanding of the health uh, uh, issue, and they need to be free from any unreasonable influence that controls how choices are made. The individual should be allowed to self-choose a plan to promote his or her notion of health. Autonomous individuals should be those who act of their own volition, understand the effects of their actions, and are not unduly influenced in their decision-making, even if in uniform. In the MASH series, I myself came to value the judgment and actions of Colonel Sherman Potter, after whose leadership and practice style I began to model my own. Colonel Potter, a gifted surgeon and an administrator and a veteran of World War II in the, in, depicted in the, in the series, respected the autonomy of the soldier patient. He balanced beneficence with maleficence, and he understood how to harmonize his actions with the larger moral imperatives of war. In the end, the higher moral imperative is to prevent the conflict through effective use of diplomatic, economic, and international instruments of power. And if these fail, to quickly end the conflict and, and the taking of lives by the effective use of military force. 
And to do that requires fit and capable experienced soldiers who have chosen to serve their nation and whom we protect from harm or restore to health so that they can realize their aspirations to serve and defend the nation. So with this foundation of clinical ethics, which drives many of the decisions for the care of individual patients, allow me now to move on to my next major topic of concern today, our institutional or organizational ethics for caring for the wounded, ill, and injured warrior. This has been a subject of much debate within the services, within the Department of Defense and the interagency, and, many, and among the American people, service members, and, uh, and veterans advocacy groups, and, and, and they're represented by stories that you read in the media and debates that are being held all the time among uh, uh, the most senior government representatives at, at all levels. The power of this debate and its importance as a strategic issue for senior and military and political leaders is perhaps no better illustrated by uh, what Dr. Cook earlier referenced, the fury that erupted in early 2007 over media stories concerning the care of wounded, ill, and injured soldiers and other service warriors um, at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. For those who don't uh, recall those events or may not have been aware of them at all, I'm going to use a few images just as a reminder and to explain that. This happens to be a picture taken of, uh, of the stands uh, in, in the Wagner gym there on the Walter Reed campus where we had about 800 uh, wounded and in, injured uh, soldiers, uh, both combat wounded, uh, suffering from serious illnesses um, or had suffered injuries, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, training accidents, a whole variety of things. In February of 2007, a, a series of stories in the Washington Post were published about problems with the coordination of care, largely outpatient focused, and living conditions for the wounded, ill, and injured. This happens to be Building 18 that is often referred to in those stories. It's across the street, actually, from the Walter Reed campus. It's an old hotel that we purchased about 35 years ago and used to use for transit billets for, for trainees coming in and off, enlisted and officers. But we slowly converted as a, as a place to house about 85 uh, ambulatory patients who could walk across the street and go back and forth to, to clinics as an outpatient. The stories were about the living conditions within uh, Building 18 and about the coordination of care. And I have to be uh, very clear here in saying that no one um, ever in looking at the inpatient care of, of patients and how services were rendered to the patients in operating rooms or in our, in our PT clinics and the like ever has challenged uh, the value or the quality of that. And if you've been to Walter Reed yourself or to Bethesda or any of our military hospitals, I think you've seen that. What was really at uh, called into question is uh, what we were doing to transition uh, soldiers and others uh, once they got out of the inpatient setting and how were we coordinating the care in this very complex uh, terrain of outpatient care and, and, and disability adjudication. This provoked an almost immediate firestorm of public outrage and, and, and anger. Uh, congressional scrutiny, this, these were two of the original soldiers that appeared on the front pages of the Washington Post. They happened to be two of the very few uh, combat wounded that were in Building 18. Um, and, and some of the conditions that they were faced with, the soldier on the right here uh, who's lost his ear was pointing to the, the mold that was behind the, 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 the wallpaper in his room. Uh, congressional scrutiny, media uh, attention uh, was there. This happens to be the, the hearing held in, the, in Walter Reed in our, in our auditorium there in which the senior leadership was called to task um, over this, uh, this by the House Oversight and, uh, and Government Reform Committee, uh, uh, the Waxman Committee. Uh, they challenged how soldiers were receiving care, how they and their families were supported, and how they were being evaluated for, the ret for retention in the Army or transitioned into civilian life with compensation for their wounds or illnesses and, and, and how they received disability and support from the VA. The, the series ultimately resu resulted in the relief of the commanding general of, of the Army Regional Medical Command with overarching responsibility for Walter Reed. Uh, this happens to be the, the uh, secretary and, uh, and the chairman uh, uh, making announcements about uh, uh, changes that were going to be made. And, and here is the commanding general of, of the regional command and the, of the Walter Reed campus and led to the early retirement of our, of our Surgeon General at the time and the firing of the, of the Secretary of the Army ultimately. 
with major changes uh, in the structure and the processes for the care of the wounded, ill, and injured. It also resulted in the awarding of a Pulitzer Prize for the authors of the report. The Army's response was swift and comprehensive. Uh, this is, uh, uh, for those who don't recognize him, General uh, uh, Dick Cody, uh, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, standing with the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, uh, Bill Winkenwerder. The Army surged a large number of officers and NCO uh, cadre uh, to provide small unit leadership for and so family and soldier support during the healing, rehabilitation, and transitional period for recovering warriors. Uh, we stood up a new command, the, Wal the, Wal the Warrior Transition Command, and created new units, Warrior Transition Units, or WTUs, built around soldier and families and their support. This was facilitated by unit cadre, most of whom were non-medical small unit leaders and, person and personnel experts, as well as nurse case managers for navigating the difficult path of recovery and rehabilitation and primary care managers that, that are physicians who attend to first-line care needs and authorize referrals for more specialized care. So you have a cadre member, small unit leader, a squad leader, uh, first sergeant, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, and the company commanders that go with them, and the nurse case manager for navigating um, this arcane pathway through re re recovery and rehabilitation, uh, and uh, a primary care manager. We call this uh, the, the triad of care. We ended the segregation of warriors in the reserve components, the Army uh, Reserves and the National Guard, from the active component that had been our practice in the past. I have a, a personal uh, uh, perspective and role on this, as, as Dr. Cook uh, alluded to. I was expeditious, uh, expeditiously moved from a, my former command overseeing biomedical research and development for the Army and DOD and took command of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in, in, a, in about a four-hour period. And, and and took over the regional medical command with oversight over this, uh, that, that, that had, had care responsibility from Fort Drum to Fort Bragg and west to Fort Knox. I was given guidance to, to closely examine problems associated with the management of these soldiers and families. I was instructed to set up a comprehensive program to address their complaints and to remedy the issues with this critical transition time in the lives of soldiers and families. In the ensuing four years, and, and by the way, this, this, this man here, some of you recognize as Dave Rosell. Major Dave Rosell is a, is a cavalry officer, a career cavalry officer. He's the first officer of the modern era to have lost a limb in combat and to have returned to combat. He wrote a bestseller, a New York Times bestseller called Back in Action. Dave was wounded in 2003. He was found fit for duty after fitting his prosthesis in 2004. He, he completed the Ironman triathlon in Hawaii in 2005 or 2006. He's a, he's a, a gifted athlete and a devoted uh, athlete. He's now returned twice to combat, uh, once as an exo of a battalion and, and the other as a, co a company commander. Uh, he just returned from his third deployment, second as an amputee. We've sent 47 amputees back to combat uh, following the loss of their limbs. Three of them have lost their limbs in non-combat uh, accidents and have gone back to combat as amputees for the, for, for the first time. Uh, the gentleman that was sitting in the middle here, um, Sergeant Kessler happens to be a, a double amputee. He is, a, he is a, a, a company first sergeant for the Warrior Transition Unit in San Diego right now. I, I, I plucked him off the climbing wall at the, at the amputee center at Walter Reed. He was on the second story of a climbing wall. He had adapted his his prosthesis so he could climb the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the wall there within our amputee center. And he has that kind of warrior spirit that we're looking for, for, for leadership in these roles. In the ensuing four years uh, since that event, in addition to the Warrior Transition Command that is commanded by a flag officer, we've stood up Warrior Transition uh, units across the Army, uh, now 29 in number, and nine additional units in states uh, across the country where uh, soldiers can live closer to home uh, or their units. We, we currently have close to 10,000 soldiers in this uh, and have several other thousand serving as a cadre, most of, which, most of whom rather are not medics. Since the first Warrior, Warrior Transition Unit was established in June of 2007, more than 40,000 wounded, ill, and injured soldiers and their families have either progressed through or are being currently cared for within the WTUs. And we've returned over 16,000 of these soldiers to the force. 
We also began a concerted effort to advocate for the, for the fundamental reform of the physical disability and evaluation system, the PDES. This is a 50-year-old system that dates from the end of World War II. It requires the coordination of both the DOD and the DVA. I don't know how many of you in this room may have gone through a physical disability uh, 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 you know, uh, process. I've been through a board myself having suffered from an, uh, an earlier disabling or potentially uh, dis unfitting condition. And uh, we, the, the military, assess fitness for duty under Title X of the U.S. Code, which is our responsibility, with adjudication for compensation and benefits for that unfitting condition. It's then followed by a determination of the disability within the, de the Veterans Administration under the whole person concept, not just that one fit unfitting condition that led to separation from service, but everything else that may be wrong physically or emotionally with, with, with a soldier. This, this system of dual adjudication and dis, with disability compensation uh, by two departments leads to confusion and resentment by soldiers and families. They frequently ask, how, how is it that the Army only gave me a 20% disability for that unfitting condition, but when I got to the VA, I got 70%, and oh, by the way, it had, if I had 70% from the Army, I'd have been eligible for TRICARE benefits and a whole lot of other uh, uh, benefits derivative of, of military medical retirement. Uh, it, it's highly bureaucratic. It was initially intended to, to protect the rights of soldiers uh, and their due process, but, but it ultimately pits the soldier and the family against the health care system and the army and the military services. The moral imperative for this, vigorous, in, in, for this vigorous improvement in the care and rehabilitation and transition of our wounded, ill, and injured uh, warriors, I believe, lies in an obligation that was first maybe outlined by President Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address. He writes, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness to the right, in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And this is in fact the motto of the of the Veterans Administration, uh, doing honor to those who serve. What was also acknowledged by the treatment of wounded, ill, and injured warriors by the Army and DOD throughout this war and in past conflicts is a strategic imperative, perhaps first articulated by General George Washington himself, that soldiers will not fight if they're not confident in the just and generous treatment uh, by the military and the nation if they are incapacitated by injury or illness in the course of their service. It's really an, especially critical for the sustainment of an all-volunteer force. In fact, that's probably the, the one clear message that I was sent by my senior leadership as I was sent to take over Walter Reed, that we cannot sustain an all-volunteer force if mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, uh, husbands and wives are not confident that their soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman who goes into harm's way on, on, on behalf of the nation is not going to be well cared for, restored to health, if possible, given the optimal opportunity to remain a soldier or warrior, if possible, and, and so desired, and compensated, uh, if not. For the reserve component, this is especially difficult. We continue to grapple with the balance in caring for returning wounded, ill, and injured soldiers among and between our military hospitals with, with soldiers remaining on active duty for their treatment and adjudication of fitness and disability and care in the VA system or care out in the civilian networks following their de demobilization and return to civilian life. It's particularly problematic for reserve soldiers who, who are bearing a heavy load of deployments in the Army as we employ our reserves as an operational reserve force rather than a strategic reserve as it was used during the Cold War. Reserve units are in cycle and in, in deployment uh, with other active component units and individuals, but just on a slower expeditionary cycle, or what we call the Army Force Generation Model. What compounds the problem is the availability of care for these soldiers in parts of the country where access to military treatment facilities and VAs is not very good. Even TRICARE uh, uh, the networks aren't really robust in some places where our reserves come. One recent case which illustrated these problems occurred when we demobilized the 41st Combat uh, Brigade Combat Team out of the Oregon Army National Guard at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Fort, Fort Lewis, up in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Reports began to suffer uh, to surface that we lacked training within our 
our soldier readiness center where we were sending, demobilizing, mobilizing and demobilizing soldiers, and they were being sent home without adequate medical screening and, and without a plan. Intense media and congressional scrutiny is followed, and a series of congressional or commanders' inquiries were held. Uh, it's resulted in a large number of, of specific findings and remedial measures that are being taken. For example, it, we found that some of the soldiers were improperly released from active duty based upon medical personnel who, in good faith, but erroneously believed that they could access care once they got back home and, uh, and would access the VA or the TRICARE. And so we've clarified what, uh, what care is available in, in states. We've worked on the Transition Assistance Management Program, or TAMP, and, and what VA benefits are out there. This discussion of caring for wounded, ill, and injured warriors and the struggles to improve the process of disability adjudication to work effectively with the other services in the VA and de 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 fighting, depend, uh, deciding on fitness and adjudicating disability would be incomplete if I didn't raise one competing problem that's begun to arise. We now face the problem of the impact of our growing population of medically non-ready or, or medically non-deployable soldiers as we begin to draw down uh, the force on the readiness of the force. One of the problems with the adjudication system, this is a very complex slide for which I apologize, but what you can see here over the last uh, three to four years and even beyond is that we've made very little progress in how much time it takes to get through the disability evaluation system. In fact, it's got, if anything, longer even with seeming improvements in it. And we see a growing population of, of both reserve and active soldiers, whether they're inside or outside warrior transition units. Not all of our disability adjudicated soldiers or those in the disability evaluation system are within warrior transition units. Many of them are out there in the rear detachments of our units back in camps, posts, and stations. And what we've seen is a growing population of these as they're bogged down in this disability adjudication system. What we're facing is as the Army draws down below a critical uh, limit of what's needed to be deployed and, st and stay abreast of what our op tempo is, this, this population of medically non-deployable uh, soldiers because of illnesses or injuries, even if they're not in the disability system, or those that are in the disability system but are languishing, has begun to threaten the population of deployables that we have here. And we've, begun, we've dropped below a critical threshold where we can keep up with the rate of, of demand of our, of our soldiers. So now we have two competing problems, the, the demand for and the requirement and the obligation for us to care for the wounded, ill, and injured and to adjudicate their disability and their service appropriately with the readiness of the, of the Army as it's under this intense pressure to continue to deploy and support of the wars. I'd like to move for my last piece to a brief discussion of challenges that are facing you soldiers and sailors, airmen, marine, and coast guardsmen, as well as our deployable civilian workforce as we complete our 10th year of ongoing conflicts in two theaters of war. Yesterday we released the seventh in an ongoing series of studies on the mental health or behavioral health of the deployed force which has been conducted annually in Afghanistan and Iraq since 2003-2004. These surveys have highlighted the burden of deployment and combat-related stresses on a force which has been deployed, often with little dwell time back at home station, at least below the optimal dwell time that we'd like to have for 24 months between deployments. Previous mental health advisory team studies, MHAT studies, have shown that, that a soldier who is deployed uh, with a dwell time shorter than 24 months does not allow enough time to restore their baseline uh, level of psychological health. And the Army has not been able to achieve a two-year dwell time since the war began for all intents and purposes on average. Our growing experience is the need for all of you, all of you, to be attentive to your health and fitness in a holistic sense, mind, body, spirit, social, and family fitness. Particularly worrisome are the cumulative effects of a high op tempo and the potential for delayed recognition of these effects on, on new warriors. We see this in the slow accumulation of physical injuries, which are sometimes neglected or overlooked, but equally concerning are the delayed emergence of anxiety and depression and the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, uh, which are an expected feature of any life-threatening or life-altering event 
for the majority of human beings. In fact, we think that battlefield concussion, uh, mild traumatic brain injury on the battlefield, has a very close association with later emergence of post-traumatic stress reactions. There's something about being concussed on the battlefield that's different from being concussed as, uh, as Ben Rothberger was, uh, you know, as a stealer in a stadium on a Sunday afternoon with a trainer in the crowd uh, screaming in your ears. When you awaken from a concussion in an IED attack or an ambush with, with friends injured or killed, uh, you know, with the carnage of war and with people still shooting at you, uh, it does something to that brain that's being reset and uh, we think leads to lingering problems with post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress reactions if not addressed. Promptly recognized and promptly treated Physical and emotional problems are largely treatable and reversible, and we have direct experience with that. My biggest fear is for soldiers who have experienced concussions on the battlefield, for example, which we know is associated with neurocognitive defect, de deficits if it's repeated, problems with memory and calculations and the like, but also are associated with be these behavioral health problems that I've described. They're often overlooked or their treatment is avoided because of fear or stigma associated with its treatment. Among the most readily available over-the-counter medications for soldiers in this situation, it's readily available, it's in the public, it's ubiquitous. There's a medicine that's used every day. It's called alcohol, and it suppresses uh, problems with sleep. It takes away intrusive thoughts, uh, and it calms the nerves. But it's leading to uh, inordinate problems and rising problems with alcohol abuse and even dependence on alcohol the use of prescription drugs even inappropriately and, and growing signs of problems in interpersonal relations and marital problems, uh, are, these are all signs of deployment related issues that, that are not being properly addressed. At the end of the day, your leadership, not simply my medical intervention, is what is most badly needed. Your leadership. The force looks to its line leadership for the example of building and sustaining resilience of self-care for all dimensions of health and fitness, and for guidance about seeking care for behavioral health problems, physical injuries, and alcohol and drug use. We were asked during our media roundtable yesterday by the reporters there as to where the military will be looking to solve problems of resistant stigma associated uh, or perceived by soldiers and Marines associated with the care for behavioral health issues, where we'll look for uh, enforcement of sleep discipline, which is now contributing to problems, and the Marines have been good to highlight this, uh, and for prompt recognition and, and aggressive treatment of alcohol and drug-related issues. And what I consistently return to with those reporters and all audiences is your leadership as line leaders in recognizing and attacking these issues. Um, I'm eager to hear any questions now that you might have concerning these and other deployment-related health issues that you are concerned about. Before I close and welcome your questions, I'd like to share you, with you a short film which gets at an underlying but unspoken theme throughout my talk. And if we could roll the video. We are an organization now 235 years old. We've had at every conflict or every battle that has fought to preserve our freedoms, we've had Army Medicine there. And our warrior ethos talks about mission first, never accepting defeat, never quitting, and most importantly to our medics, to never leave a fallen comrade. That's the contract we make with the American soldier and his or her family. We talk about the privilege to serve for those that are entrusted to our care. So trust is embedded in our basic mission. And then at the center of what we do is preserve life, to, uh, to relieve suffering, to optimize function, and at all times to promote the growth of, of the people we care for. The premise that we work on is that there is a culture there of trust, and therefore I'm automatically going to make the assumption that you have my best interest in heart and I have your best interest. That's the kind of relationship with our patients that we never want to lose. Keeping your promises is, you know, it's about a commitment you've made. And if you do what you say you're going to do, then your people trust you. And everything you do needs to be related to how you build and communicate that trust. That if you can't do that, that all of the technical expertise and all of your hard work and all of your late nights 
um, or will be for naught. And if you don't have trust, then, then you cannot ever have a positive relationship because trust is the basis, I believe, of, of every positive relationship. You never move away from your core values. You never move away from the foundation which trust is based upon. This notion of cultivating trust, it's something that's measurable and tangible. It's, it's reflected in, in discrete behaviors. And it starts by, by us leaders modeling the behaviors that we want our people to display. And we're trying to cultivate what those behaviors are, what the dialogue is, how one measures it. And to do that, we have to be able to do it in a somewhat standard way from one end of Army Medicine to the other, from where the, for the, when the sun comes up to where the sun goes down. I think what we've learned over probably the last nine years is the importance of transparency, the importance of looking critically at what we do to see where we can improve. We have to be open to listening to our people. We have to make sure that we have those periodic dialogues with them, you know, between staff and supervisor, etc. And that extends all the way to our patients. Positive feedback lets us know that we're moving in the right direction, we're doing the right kinds of things. The negative feedback lets us know where we need to redirect. We want to ensure that our patients understand that we have the best for them at the forefront of our decisions. And, and so they need to trust us that we have their best interest and we need to trust each other that we're working collaboratively as a team to achieve that. It's that trust that we want to keep coming back to and cultivating because it's at the cornerstone. It's really more than that, it's the glue that holds the whole organization together. Our whole mission is about taking care of America's sons and daughters. I believe our nation trusts us to provide the very best health care for those that are wearing the cloth of our nation. The American fighting man and woman will take enormous risks, will kick down a door in the worst neighborhood in, in the world because they're armed with the knowledge that over their shoulder is a medic who, if they're harmed in the course of defending the country, uh, will be there to save their life, to ensure that they're brought back to their families, will have the greatest opportunity to return to uniform, and if not, to return to life as a productive citizen. Establishing warrior transition units, improving disability evaluation systems, they provide little value if the soldier and the military family do not trust that the goal that, that is in our minds is to attend to their well-being. It's one of beneficence. It's built on mutual trust. Increasing trust exponentially improves organizational effectiveness. Systems and processes often fail because the underlying organizational trust level is low. We're working hard in Army Medicine to build and maintain that trust, some of which was eroded or threatened by the events in Walter Reed in, in 2007. Employees who support the military family can be coached to adopt specific behaviors, beliefs, and mindsets that increase trust. Organizations where the level of trust is high achieve more with less. Employees in such organizations are able to focus better on achieving missions. We're rebuilding the culture of trust in Army medicine, and the intention and the focus of this culture of trust initiative, the, the, the pilot video for which you've just seen, is to increase and sustain trust for all stakeholders and customers and patients. <laughs> Secretary of Defense has told us that our most important mission after defending the nation is to care for our warriors and their families. A critical part of our warrior ethos is pledging never to leave a fallen comrade. The soldier fights knowing that he or she won't be left behind. The warrior ethos does not end when you leave the battlefield. Warriors and their families have to trust that we will never leave them behind here at home either. Compassionate caring is a requirement for everyone at every level within the military. The mission is not accomplished until you create an effective and efficient military built to meet the needs of all members, all families. I thank you again for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, if we have time for questions, I, I really am eager to hear what you have to say. And before I close, I would like to thank each and every one of you and your families for the service you render this nation, for the pledge that you took, the oath that you took to defend the nation, my family, 
uh, in, the, in the nation I love. Thank you very much. We do indeed have about half an hour for questions. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we are recording this session, so don't let that inhibit you, please, but the purpose of doing that is to make this available uh, for the people who do this by distance education and so forth. Also remind you that uh, if you do have a question, please stand up and use the mic in front of you. Um, I'd like to take the uh, privilege of the Master of Ceremonies to ask the first question, if I might. Sure. Um, I've gotten very interested in this very small but emerging literature out of the VA about the concept of moral injury as distinct from PTSD. Right. And you touched on it briefly regarding the sequestering of blood from enemy uh, wounded in that case. Uh, uh, can you say more about it? The general notion is, uh, is there something that happens to people when they themselves act in ways at variance with their basic moral values? Or if they are forced to participate, even if not directly acting, in activities that violate those values, right? What are the consequences of that? And uh, I think it is distinct from post-traumatic stress. It's, an, it's, a, not, it's a new concept. Um, have you seen, it, it can, can you say any more about that? Is the Army looking into that? Uh, I, I, I can't say that, that we are, uh, Dr. Cook. I, I mean, I'd, I'd be more than welcome to get back to you on that and see what we are doing. I, I will tell you that one of the more riveting texts that I, I read is, uh, is by a VA psychiatrist, you may have read it yourself, uh, Achilles in Vietnam. Yes. Uh, and I think he gets at the, the issue of, of, of the moral injury that, that he saw uh, of veterans who suffered, uh, who served in earlier conflicts in coming to grips with their behavior in battle. Um, and it, it led me, and I think he, his thesis was, in fact, that, that many of the struggles that we have in the current conflict are not new, obviously, to this conflict. In fact, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey might very well have been in a pre-literate time, uh, in, in, in a time of oral history, uh, I mean, oral uh, tradition, uh, the way that, uh, that the combatants in a warrior culture were educated about the consequences of acting in an unethical way in conflict. If you remember, Achilles in the 10th year of a 10-year war uh, violated the rules of, of war and, and offended the gods in, in his treatment of, of enemy combatants, and he paid a dear price for it. And, and this, this VA psychiatrist, and this sounds a little bit spooky and, and, and mushy, but, but was able to tie together the fact that maybe there's a four or 5,000-year observation that when human beings under the most difficult of circumstances act in conflict with their, with their moral underpinnings. They suffer deeply psychologically as a consequence of that. Uh, and, and I, I think, uh, observe that uh, informally, but I, but I do think that this notion needs to be looked at more carefully. Yeah, in case you're interested in the reference, it's Jonathan Shea is the author's name of, mm -hmm. of that book. Uh, uh, um. All right, the floor is open to questions from, from you, please, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Sorry, good morning. Uh, Captain Donna Cottrell, Coast Guard. General, thanks for your comments. Can you comment on the perceived overprescription of class three narcotics, specifically things like Oxycontin and that sort of thing, and uh, resulting addictions that people are suffering from? Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks. And, and, and I promised myself, and I'm not, I'm not sucking up to you, I don't have to, you're coasting, and I'm, we're, you're not even the same. You know, department. But I, I once served, uh, provided health care in the southeast and uh, in Puerto Rico for a very large number of uh, Coast Guards, men and women. I, I have to tell you, you are a remarkable community. I've never seen a, a more self-reliant and, uh, and, and unwinding population as Coast Guards, men and women. I, I just have to say that right out here in, in public. I, I, that, and it's also a young man's sport. I, I just can't imagine, I couldn't believe the stories I heard of these kids in the Mediterranean, or excuse me, in the Caribbean on cigarette boats doing interception of, uh, of drugs. Which is back to your, your question. Um, we are facing an epidemic in this country of the use of prescription and misuse of the prescription drugs. In fact, um, uh, this is now being addressed by the, uh, by the President's office, uh, uh, the White House office on, on drug policy. In 17 of 50 states in the country today, there are more deaths by uh, the inappropriate or, uh, uh, or illegal use of prescription drugs than by motor vehicle accidents. 
in 17 of 50 states. Uh, we, have, we now have pill mills in southern Florida that are pumping out OxyContin and, and other addicting uh, opioids uh, run by uh, unscrupulous uh, docs and others. And, and it's become an almost uh, entry-level drug for a lot of people who eventually shift over to heroin because heroin more, is more easily accessible and it's cheaper than, than the prescription drugs. So it's become a huge problem, and it's not just restricted to the military, although we're targeted because we, we are, uh, you know, an open book uh, and, and, and operate in a, in a, in a, a, a fish bowl here. Uh, what we're doing within uh, the Army, and we're beginning to do across uh, all of the services, is to look at alternatives to the use of, of drugs, especially for pain management. Um, um, I, I chartered two years ago a task force uh, for comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive look at how we manage pain, uh, both with medications and non-medication approaches. We, uh, we the U.S. military, um, uh, and, and one of the heroes of this is an anesthesiologist at Walter Reed named Trip Buckenmeyer, Colonel Trip Buckenmeyer, was one of the first to, to do regional anesthesia on the battlefield where, where someone had an amputation or a very severe extremity injury, had a catheter placed as close as possible to the injury and then began to infuse um, you know, drugs that would numb the, the limb. And what we've discovered by that is that by aggressively treating uh, pain as close to the front line as possible, and in a continuous fashion, if possible, through the entire evacuation chain. If you've ever seen one of your soldiers or Marines or others uh, on the evacuation chain, they often have a little bright orange ambit pump that's been determined to be airworthy to go on helicopters and, and, and evacuation aircraft. And that infuses drug the whole time that they're being evacuated back. And once they get back to Walter Reed or Bethesda or Brook Army Medical Center or, or, or San Diego or wherever. What we've discovered is if you're aggressive about appropriate use of drugs, later on they don't suffer from, from, from a phantom limb pain as much. And we can reduce the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder associated with that injury by as much as 50% by the appropriate use of drugs. But inappropriate use of drugs is leading to what you just referred to, Captain, which is too much addiction, to, uh, too much dependency upon it. So this comprehensive uh, pain management task force I charted was to look holistically at how we can manage pain across all modalities that are available and to open the aperture into complementary and alternative and integrative methods. I, I'm married to a yoga instructor who reminds me every day that yoga is a very effective way of treating both post-traumatic stress and pain. In fact, that's how she got into it initially as, a, as an injured athlete. And so we're using yoga, uh, uh, we're using uh, visualization techniques, uh, guided imagery, we're using uh, acupuncture now on the battlefield, and in, including on the battlefield, auricular acupuncture is very effective for a lot of people uh, from even combat wounds. Um, we've, uh, we've applied this now as a target, uh, piloted at Walter Reed. Two years ago at the Warrior Transition Unit at Walter Reed, I'm told that 87% of our patients about 700 of them uh, in total in that unit were on some prescription narcotic. We're down to 10% today. And that's by using other non-prescription, non-narcotic alternatives. And I encourage everybody in the audience, by the way, uh, many of you are, are sort of uh, aging athletes and, and, and injured in a subclinical way with bad backs and bad knees and headaches and the like. To, if you haven't done this, to explore alternatives to the use of, of, uh, of a potentially addicting drugs. Thanks for the question. I appreciate that. Sir. Morning, gentlemen. Lieutenant Commander Lopez, U.S. Navy. Sir, you stated opening your, your presentation about the obligation we have to treat our warriors, and the video confirmed the contract that we have. This conflict has demonstrated the value of forward resuscitated surgical services. We've been able to accomplish that because of the large land-based footprint we have through caches for the Army and the EMS for the Navy. However, with the moving of the modularization of the Army brigades and the sea-based medical concept for the Navy, in an austere, access-denied environment, are we going to be able to perform and have the success rate that we have using those concepts in future wars well, that we may experience that's a, casualties? That's a great question. And I'm, I'm glad you asked it. If you go back, I mean, one of the more sobering things I ever did was to go and visit my counterpart, Surgeon General in the, excuse me, in, the in France. 
and, and, and went to their uh, Walter Reed equivalent in, in Paris, uh, uh, Valley de Grasse. And on the wall of their museum annex to that are paintings from the Napoleonic War of, of echeloned evacuation of casualties at sea that took place during the Napoleonic era, which we forgot about and didn't know about in the US military until the Civil War. That was introduced in the Civil War by Jonathan Letterman, as an army uh, physician who was assigned to, to, to be the physician of the Army of the Potomac. And at the Battle of Antietam, he, it was the first time he staged echelons of care on a battlefield. Up until that point, we had no uh, technique for, nor even a sense of obligation to, to clear the battlefield and to treat soldiers uh, in a timely way. It was best tested at, at, at Gettysburg when uh, Letterman, who in October of, of, eight, of 1862 published a manual on how echelons of care were, were to be used and embedded the ambulance system inside the medical department. But, but Meade uh, rescinded the order that, that Letterman issued and only one corps executed the order to have an ambulance service and far forward surgical care. And the results of which were that they cleared in that core area all casualties within 24 hours, while the rest of the battlefield was literally overrun by, by uh, dead and dying soldiers, many of whom bled to death or drowned in creeks uh, that, were, that were flooded during the rains after, after the, the battle ended. They didn't clear the battlefield, if you read the book uh, Debris of Battle, for as long as a week or 10 days afterwards. Now what happened between the Civil War and the, war, and the, and the Spanish-American War where we went back to having essentially a debacle in the way that we conducted care. And what happened is exactly what you're describing, is that we, we got lean again, we had efficiencies and cost cutting that took the medical system down and uh, returned it to an ineffective and inefficient system. And many of us are concerned about what you're describing here today. It's our responsibility, it's one of my responsibilities and, and my counterparts in the other services to make sure we don't lose these lessons. Because these wars, uh, have been punctuated by lessons that have advanced survival on the battlefield to, to a height that's never been achieved before and continues to be. In fact, some of the more severely wounded soldiers and Marines that we're seeing today are being seen back in our hospitals only because they would not have survived a previous war. Uh, Senator Inouye, who had lost his arm in the Italian campaign in, in World War II, often says, there were no surviving double amputees in his, in his uh, division. So it's a great question. It's something we all have to be working on. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Boy. Would you repeat that question for the video? Yeah, a great question. The major has asked. Uh, he, he's taken up the challenge that, that line leadership really needs to be engaged in, and small unit leaders need to be engaged in solutions for soldiers that are facing uh, behavioral health, mental health problems. But then how do we balance the need and desire for anonymity on the part of the patient or the soldier who's seeking care with, with, the, with, the, with the commander's knowledge that they have that and the fear that, that, that the community at large will, will know about the problems. A good example of that is what we're doing in some piloted programs with alcohol treatment we call KTEP. It's the Confidential Alcohol Treatment Program. Um, in a select number of Army posts right now, uh, let me go back to the, 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 the program for alcohol treatment in general within the Army is that uh, if a soldier has an alcohol problem, the command is notified that they will be placed into an alcohol treatment program. But we, we know that many of our soldiers will not seek timely care for alcohol problems until they do something that results in an adverse social outcome, like a DUI or you know, get in a fight somewhere, or, you know, have a domestic uh, dispute. 
the, and which gets them into a downward spiral. And so we, we, in targeted areas, started a program where soldiers can self-identify and can confidentially be treated for alcohol problems without the knowledge of their commanders. Well, you can imagine that Army leadership was not comfortable with this, and most uh, commanders, unit commanders, were very uncomfortable with the notion that soldiers were being treated without their knowledge for alcohol. But, but they, were, they showed a lot of courage in, in allowing us to do this. And what we have discovered is that, that many soldiers now are coming out of the woodwork to, to admit to having early alcohol problems and getting treatment treated before it becomes a serious problem for them. Now numbering in the six or 700 uh, we've identified. And, and the fact is that for most commanders, uh, or, and for most people being treated for a serious alcohol problem, part of the treatment is to go out and, and, and eventually educate or, or inform people in your support system that you have an alcohol problem so you can get that support. So the commanders ultimately learn about it. But your point is a great one, and that is that we walk a, a tightrope all the time between how much commanders know and small unit leaders know about the, the intimate behavioral health problems of their soldiers um, and how much is kept from them so that soldiers are encouraged to, to get the care. Other, otherwise, we're fearful that, that because of stigma or fears of, uh, about what will happen to their careers that they won't. And, and I don't have an, a ready solution for that. What we, ha what we are doing uh, right now is encouraging, and in fact, I put out a mandate to my commanders that they have a very frank discussion with commanders on their installations as to what they can and can't share with the commanders so that we have continuity of management of behavioral health issues without threatening or without driving the problem underground because soldiers fear uh, the loss of anonymity. Can I ask a follow on on that? Yeah. Um, early on, um, the Army had a pretty well demonstrated problem with, uh, with line commanders not accepting um, requests for mental health treatment by their subordinates or dismissing them or even humiliating them. And I know the Army put in a fairly large program to try to educate commanders to be more aware of that. Can you say more about where that stands and how the balance gets struck? Well, I, you know, you're right. In fact, we have some, we have some uh, probably almost tragic examples in which we think that, that unit leadership, uh, uh, either humiliating soldiers who had behavioral health problems or discouraging them from getting care, resulted in, in some cases, in some rather disastrous results, not just suicides, but uh, probably the best example was uh, in the two brigades of the 4th Infantry Division in Fort Carson, Colorado, in about a two and a half to three year period, around 2007, 2008, um, experienced, uh, uh, the Fort Carson community experienced uh, 10 murders and attempted murders uh, 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 that were conducted by 14 soldiers uh, in, co in, in the aggregate, I mean different events. Some of them, uh, some of the soldiers did more than one, but in the aggregate, 14 soldiers. 10 of those soldiers came from a single brigade uh, at Fort Carson, about uh, 4,000 soldiers. And six of the 10 came from a single battalion within that brigade. And when we, when we compared that brigade of soldiers to a sister brigade and very, very carefully looked at the epidemiology, we call an epidemiologic consulting team, or EPICON, what we discovered is relative to the brigade that was not uh, engaged in uh, those, the, the, those, kind of, those kind of crimes, uh, both brigades were actively involved in, in uh, deployment, redeployment. In fact, the, the one brigade had gone out the, the door from Korea to, uh, to, uh, to Iraq, back to Fort Carson, not back to Korea, and then out again after a very short dwell and then got extended in theater for 15 months during the surge. And that was the brigade that was having the problems. And when we started dissecting it down, what we discovered, uh, Dr. Cook, was that, that these soldiers who were engaged in these crimes, many of them um, were engaged in, in petty misconduct that was not promptly attended to by the small unit leader, or were, were involved in drug and alcohol abuse that was not attended to. And psychological problems weren't attended to because within the brigade as a whole, and especially within that battalion, there was a known presence of, of leadership that, that humiliated and suppressed uh, the, the need for, for care. In fact, we followed 25,000 soldiers going through each of these two brigades, 25,000 in each, for the period of time that we're talking about as they came, as they, before they went in, 
after they entered the brigade and after they left the brigade to go to other units. And what we discovered is before they entered the brigade, there were about equivalent uh, use of behavioral health uh, services. While they were in the brigade, this group uh, within that brigade that had suppression uh, was, was pushed down and didn't, didn't seek care. And once they came back out, they kind of rebounded. So we have very good indirect evidence and we have the effects of that uh, from this epicon that tells us when, when unit leadership uh, actively suppresses and humiliates or downplays um, the importance of get, seeking early care, uh, it has uh, potentially disastrous effects. In this case, it, it resulted in murders and attempted murders. Yeah, I was living in Springs when those rash of murders remember occurred. That. I remember it well. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. General, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wathlin, uh, U.S. Air Force. Um, seems like we're approaching or have uh, reached an ethical dilemma in that uh, our ability to care for our folks has uh, exceeded our ability to pay for that care. Uh, wh what do you see as uh, maybe the solution to this as uh, it approaches or it's getting here? I actually had a slide up there to show you the, the rising budget for the defense health program, <laughs> anticipating that w one or more of you, because Secretary Gates has gone public with a notion, I think, I think his quote was that, that medical care is eating his lunch. And, and uh, and it's prompted by the fact that over the last year, you can see uh, from, from FY05 on, the amount of annual expenditure in, def in the defense health uh, program. Um, health care costs within the Department of Defense are through a single appropriation called the defense health budget. In fact, the defense health program. In fact, my budget uh, in Army Medicine, which is about $12 billion, is 90% through the Defense Health Program and, and the other is through uh, Operation and, and, and uh, Maintenance Army uh, dollars. This has been growing, as you can see, rather dramatically. In fact, I think it's, it's approaching 60 billion now. Uh, it, it was as low as 20 billion if you go back 15 years ago or so. So we're experiencing what the rest of the country is experiencing in terms of the growth of the cost of healthcare, much of it being driven by an expansion of the health care benefit that's been provided. Uh, for example, in 2002, Congress extended this very generous benefit to Medicare eligible retirees and retiree family members who were eligible for health care within the Department of Defense and made Medicare a first payer and then TRICARE a second payer for any dollars above what Medicare paid for. So for the Medicare retiree beneficiary, includes including my dad and now includes my mom, uh, this is an incredible benefit. But it resulted in a huge spike, about a, about a 20 to 30 percent increase in the overall cost of, of health care within the military. I have to tell you that my solution to this, because I think we are facing the same problem outside the gate. I'm, I'm, I'm not being flippant with the secretary. I would never do that, disrespect him. But, but I always ask when I hear that, that medis, medical care in the military is eating his lunch, compared to what? I mean, because you can imagine if this were in the hands of some folks, it, it, you know, it's not just our lunches that would be eaten, it would also be our breakfasts, our dinners, and maybe snacks in between. And, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to do, and my fellow Surgeons General are trying to do, as well as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, is come back to the basics here to redirect um, healthcare dollars toward prevention and health promotion. To, to get out of what I think American healthcare is suffering from right now, which is um, interventionally uh, oriented, um, uh, inpatient and, uh, and expensive uh, medical care once, uh, once we fail to prevent an injury or an illness and, and start to move all of the, of the attention to the left toward prevention, a health promotion, reduction in, in our problems with obesity, for example, which is going to translate into rising problems with, with heart disease and diabetes and other things. To partner together as three military medical services to give the very best evidence-based practices that reduce unwarranted variation in practices. As much as 30 percent of medical care costs is, is estimated in, in the U.S. is as a consequence of unnecessary uh, care being rendered or variable care being rendered that's much more expensive rather than focus on what we call evidence-based practices where we have very clear evidence that, that doing a certain uh, number of things for chronic illnesses like heart disease and asthma 
and diabetes, for example, can, can, can pr provide the best clinical outcome and reduce the overall burden of cost. That's my approach to it. Long answer, but I think it's such an important question that you've asked. Does that get close to what you are interested in? Thanks. I think we have time for maybe one more question, please. Sir. Oh, Admiral. Sir. Okay. Good morning, General. Commander Sampson Stevens from the Coast Guard. Uh, thanks for bringing up the last point about preventable health care and uh, health promotion. It fits into kind of a bunch of themes that I try to articulate a clear question here. Uh, when you look at preventable lifestyle choices that result in those host, uh, that disease suite, so to speak, right. conditions and the associated costs with that, how, how do you envision uh, translating that down to you know, the appropriate level of encouragement and or mandate and or provision of choices to service members to make the right. right choices without necessarily saying you are going to do that and classic you know, case in points are things like smoking, uh, cigarettes at the exchange, alcohol at the exchange, and you know, people are going to pin me up for saying, get rid of that. That's not necessarily what I'm saying, but how do you manage that uh, level of, we have influence in your life when we're on base with you, right. the rest of your life, the other however many hours a day, we I, can control that. Thanks, I, I think you seized on, on the real challenge for us for the next decade. I'm, um, what you're really talking about is behavioral modification, effective behavioral modification of risky behaviors. And it's, it's not just around things like diabetes and obesity and, and, um, and, and diet and, and exercise that affects heart disease, but it's risky behaviors, uh, you know, riding a motorcycle at 120 miles an hour. Uh, you know, I don't care if you have a helmet on or personal protective equipment. If you hit a bollard at 120 miles an hour, you're not going to survive it. And, 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 and smoking. I mean, w is there anybody left in America who doesn't know smoking is bad for you? I mean, weren't those all the, the witnesses at the, the tobacco trials that we had a number of years ago? Aren't those folks all either educated or now dead? So everybody knows about the deleterious effects of, of unhealthy behaviors, but I think the real challenge is how we modify behavior. Uh, and, and, and it seems to me that the military of all people, we, we focus on behavior. That's one of our core competencies, is to change the behaviors of people in a proven way. Uh, I'm what we're trying to do, very hard to do, is to, to begin using scientific tools and techniques to help people make the right choices, not just educate them. I don't think that's where the challenge is any longer. I think education's out there. I think people are informed. But I think we are challenged by, and I'm, I'm, I'm myself have a problem with this, is uh, how do you make the right choices, the healthy choices, um, when there are so many distractions for or reasons not to do that? And I think that's where, really where we're going. And, and part of this, and I'll, I'll finish my comment, is to incentivize those of us who are part of the medical community to do the right kind of things and the right kind of interventions rather than to build the kind of widgets of care, of interventional care that, that, that we've been uh, rewarded for in the past. What we've observed in military medicine, especially the Army, is if I incentivize my commanders and, and hospitals, clinics, and otherwise to focus on improving population and individual health and reward them for do that, even capitalize them so that they can go out and do programs that, that uh, that lead people to, to healthier behaviors, they start doing that and, and, and we're rewarded for it. So uh, I, I think what you just raised is really the challenge that we, that we need to grapple with, changing risky behaviors. Right, well, do you want the last question? Sure. Thank you for your, uh, being here today. Thank you for 41 years of service and your oh. family service. Thanks for bringing up my brother, the Army psychiatrist, my big brother. Uh, on that, not to bring up a sore subject, but were there any ethical lessons learned from your unique pers perspective on the Fort Hood shooting? Wow, uh, tough one. Um, you know, I think what we're grappling with there, this is Eric Schoomaker speaking, uh, is, is recognizing self-radicalization um, uh, in a timely way um, by bringing um, all of the facts and all of the information together in a timely enough way and putting it in the hands of people who can do something about it. Um, I, I, 
I can tell you uh, that those held accountable within the medical side, especially for this uh, uh, soldier physician who had spent an awful lot of time in our system. He had served as a non-medical soldier before he went to medical, undergraduate school and medical school. He, he then went to undergraduate school in a, you know, at Virginia Tech and was a, you know, an excellent student. He, he came back to our own medical school and, and, and went through uh, you know, an education program and then was trained within our own system by a lot of people, none of whom saw or recognized signs that, that this was gonna be a mass murderer someday. And uh, what I've said to the press and, and uh, but I hold to uh, is that we maybe didn't have the best physician or the best officer there, but nothing that we saw would have given us any reason to believe that this was gonna be a mass murder. And I think that's the real the dilemma there. How do we recognize and act in a timely way on self-radicalization for this lone wolf out there? And I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer for that, to be candid with you. I don't think, I think everybody that I know of who's interactive, you know, the day after the shooting at Fort Hood, I went to Walter Reed where, where, where the doctor who's been accused of this was treated, excuse me, was trained and in a room about this size, talked to all of the members of the behavioral health community that were part of the, training him or, or worked with him. Were, these, are, these are experts in behavioral health, human behavioral health. About 200 of them had personally interacted with this guy. And I said, that should tell you something about the difficulty in recognizing what we had right in our midst. And I think this is gonna be a real challenge for us. I, I'm not sure I got at your question, but I, it, we've really agonized over what we could do differently. General Schoomaker, it's been a real pleasure. It was an excellent talk. Thank you very Thank much you. for being with us. We'll take about a 15-minute break. Be back at 10.30.